War is fun. How could it not be if the Call of Duty franchise keeps making games about it? There is no good, there is no evil. There are only the stock prices of Lockheed Martin. Welcome to Modern Warfare. The other one, we, we don't talk about the other. The one where it all began, when players in Infinity Ward alike concluded that bleeding out on Omaha Beach was no longer as interesting as pillaging developing nations for their petroleum reserves and wasting tens of thousands of dollars of taxpayers' money per missile. Being such a vast and long-running series, Call of Duty has had its ups and, uh, more than a few downs. But this era of games in particular has always been considered its golden era, and it all started with Call of Duty 4. And I'm going to tell you how, so be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon if you like the video, and want to see more videos of me rambling on about the good old days, like a senile old man yelling at the sun. The structure of modern warfare is very true to life. The Americans go in, cause a big mess, and things go horribly, horribly wrong. Meanwhile, the British go in behind the scenes and bail them out. The plot is war. War. More war. Business is booming. A coup d'etat in the Middle East and a civil war spanning the entire former Soviet bloc, spearheaded by a band of angry, starving Soviet boomers. This is considered a quiet day in the Call of Duty universe. Your name is Soap. Soap! Soap! What the hell kind of name is Soap? And it is your first day on the job with the SAS, the Special Anti-Watermelon Service. Nice! Your fruit killing skills are remarkable. A cabal of evil watermelons have taken over the world, and you must hone your skills in knifing watermelons if you are to save it. You can tell this is Great Britain because of how empty and barren everything is. Fun fact, this obstacle course was originally meant to be part of the tutorial, but it was removed during development, only to be reintegrated in the remaster. Now, I'm not a fan of remasters, but that is pretty good. The tutorial forces you through a classic SAS pillow fort that teaches you in order to survive the watermelon onslaughts. Every soldier has to be on the same skill level as John wick, because believe it or not, the enemy's reactions are inhuman. A lifelong diet of raw potatoes and cheap Lidl's vodka has turned these insurgents into hyper-alert paranoid wrecks. And who can blame them when Uncle Sam and his plucky British sidekick is about to kick the door in? Jokes aside, I play on veteran difficulty when indulging in the odd Call of Duty campaign. Maybe hardened if I don't feel like turning into the angry German kid every two seconds, because if you expose yourself for but one moment, some geezer will sprint out from around the corner and hit you with the red Dead Redemption Deadeye for maximum damage. I wouldn't call the enemy AI intelligent like I would call them ballsy. These guys are the real superheroes for daring to stand in the way of that one mutant psycho with the generating health superpowers, but these guys will shred you within less than a moment's notice if you're not careful. Of course, you do have the whole regenerating health thing and a legion of faceless cannon fodder to help divert the enemy's attention from you, but unfortunately it's not all that being a super secret special soldier man. God forbid you try to research how to best field strength your weapon until... What the bloody hell is that? A UAV has pinpointed your location, and a SAM site is lighting up your helicopter like a Christmas tree. All because your internet traffic was unencrypted. If only you had used NordVPN, and if only you had used the link in the description, nordvpn.com forward slash black Yoshi, for a two-year protection plan, plus four added months, no added costs. NordVPN is at the vanguard of internet data protection, allowing you to freely surf the web stress-free with inbuilt protective systems against malware, DDoS attacks, and phishing scams. With over 5,000 servers across 60 different countries all over the globe, you can access all your favorite content from anywhere in the world, while remaining completely anonymous to all potential threats, as well as bypassing any potential censorship. And I can't emphasize it enough, use the link in the description, nordvpn.com forward slash blackyoshi, and receive a two-year protection plan with four months bonus, no added costs. It seriously doesn't get any better than this. Returning to Call of Duty 4 really is an eye-opener for what good level design, pacing, and atmospheric build-up looks like. The graphical fidelity might be roughly on par with Claymation these days, but I like it. The guns don't sound completely 100% realistic, but I like it. And the story might not be the most intricately written Shakespearean masterpiece ever written, but um, honestly, there really isn't any other game in the series like Call of Duty 4. It occupies a very unique niche in the franchise with its atmosphere, appearance, and raw design. Even each subsequent game in its own sub-series diverted heavily from the source material to the point that neither sequel is recognizable to the original in any way. And this is least of all because of Call of Duty 4's incredibly drab, oppressive tone. It's incredibly understated, but Call of Duty 4's environmental design is miserable, in a good way, somehow. What I'm trying to say is, its portrayal of the rural, war-torn Eastern European countryside has a way of getting inside your head and grabbing a hold of your heart, if you let it. The game doesn't necessarily draw attention to it, but it lets the environment speak for itself, complementing the dour, monotone color palette and the 
equally understated minimalist storytelling. In fact, I would go so far as to say that Call of Duty 4 is eerily quiet. I mean, outside of the Middle East signals. Unlike the bombastic nature of the original COD games, and unlike the brutality of World at War constantly overloading your senses at every given moment, COD 4 feels strangely empty in spite of the hordes of armed goons attempting to game end you. With only a few exceptions, the soundscape is devoid of any musical ambience, save for the sounds of distant gunfire or the helicopters patrolling overhead. Even the louder, more action-packed segments of the game keep music to a bare minimum and let the carefully designed set pieces and the impactful visual and audio design speak for itself. It's things like this that I've only grown to appreciate and even notice after so many years of the series becoming senselessly louder and more bombastic as time has gone on. Granted, that doesn't mean there's no music. In fact, I would go so far as to say each piece of Modern Warfare's soundtrack is iconic and unforgettable. Most people remember the track Showdown for its poignant use in the finale and during the Chernobyl section, but I remember it more for its use during the mission Heat, as it perfectly portrays the slow realization of the odds stacked against you, pushing through an army of insurgents storming your position at the top of the hill until the tension finally hits its peak and the time for action approaches. Now with all this being said, I know there's a horde of you waiting for me to touch on the Chernobyl sections, and I mean, how could I not? Somehow, they made an exclusively on-rails linear stealth mission where you waddle close behind an angry Scottish tour guide for half an hour, not only compelling, but dare I say, fun. It's probably something to do with the fact that getting spotted doesn't immediately fail the game, but unleashes a horde of angry peasant farmers on you, introducing some real tangible consequences for your actions other than Lamau restart checkpoint. It's probably something to do with the fact that that you are repeatedly given the choice of eliminating everyone within range, or taking advantage of the game's ghillie suit mechanic to patiently worm your way through the grass without being spotted, it's probably something to do with the fact that in spite of this being a 16 year old game, the tension of lying down in the grass while a convoy of BMPs and patrolling mercenaries stepping inches away from your face still exists today. Seriously, All Gillied Up is a masterpiece, and one shot one kill after it is equally satisfying for how it flips conventions established beforehand, completely on its behind, and turns it into a game of evasion and Maneuvering. But enough of this pansy stuff like hiding in plain sight and stealth. You're not here to sit around doing nothing all the time, and if you are, that's what the RAF regiment is for. Given that this is a game from, you know, the Call of Duty series, you can count on the shooting to be refined to near perfection. And by near perfection, I mean like it pretty much is perfect. You don't become the largest and most culturally relevant first person shooter saga in human history by being serviceable at best, or yes, or uh, I guess. Yes, believe it or not, the game has shooting, a lot of it. Shooting guns, shooting bigger guns. Guns, shooting rockets, shooting people up into bloody space with a grenade launcher, shooting up on some of that Bhutanese shadow garden grown dark evil pack. It doesn't take a genius to explain to you the raw variety of big manly toys that populate this game and how fun they are to shoot. The weapon models are all a little bit archaic, in fact you can probably count the polygons and some of them on one hand, but they all look as they should, shoot as they should, sound like they should. The details on each model is very impressive and how each of them handle with a sizably significant difference between each of them even with their own niche weapon cat categories is very respectable, and makes each and every one of them you come across and pick up feel unique. I said earlier that the guns don't sound quite as realistic as they should, and I mean of course it is a video game, but they do sound incredibly satisfying. The G36C sounds way beefier than it needs to, but the M249 sounds like it has the capacity to double as a bloody anti-aircraft gun. The two weapon only system endemic to the series works very well here, as given the stark differences between each and every weapon, you're forced to pick and choose each weapon to grab for the concurrently appropriate situation on the fly. Personally, I think this is something World at War does slightly better, given the World War II setting limiting the player to the more archaic designs of the time, whose limitations are far more pronounced, but Call of Duty 4 does very well at accommodating each of its weapons for a specific use given specific combat situations, and they are all equally as satisfying to use for different reasons. Of course, COD 4 has some of the best sniping in the series, partially because it doesn't impose obligatory sniping segments on you for no reason, like it was part of a checklist, like some other game. When you do get your hands on one, however, not only 
does it generally make sense for the parameters of the battle at hand, but more often than not, you're the one who has to go out of the way and make the decision whether or not to use it. It really is amazing how far a little bit of player autonomy goes in enhancing an otherwise incredibly linear game. And although they're not the most effective weapons in the game, in fact, far from it, but the soft spot I have for the shotguns of Modern Warfare is palpable. <laughs> Just like in the multiplayer, the noob tube reigns supreme. Chances are, if you spawn with a rifle, that rifle will have a grenade launcher slapped to its belly. And as it turns out, the grenade launcher and using it with every given opportunity is how you beat this game on veteran difficulty without so much as a slap on the wrist. Because believe it or not, when you're given a weapon that can instantly vaporize 10 guys at a time with the single push of a button and are given ample munitions and opportunity to use said weapon, the game suddenly becomes a bit too easy. Especially once you learn to launch it at war behind the enemy's cover, turning you into a walking precision strike and ensuring that not one square centimetre is safe for these angry peasant farmers to hide behind. In spite of the series' reputation, however, the game isn't actually that linear. You're given quite a bit of freedom to decide how to progress, whether it be through different lanes through a level or missions like the safe house, which give you the opportunity to breach and raid any of the five houses for an enemy VIP in any order you like, with terrain that accommodates for plenty of flanking opportunities and allowing you to tackle this fairly vast mission in any way you fit. It's a small thing, but it's just about big enough for you to notice, especially on repeat playthroughs, where you may be more incentivized to start experimenting with the map and your navigation of it. In conclusion, it's really not hard to see why Call of Duty 4 is the game every subsequent entry in the series has tried and usually failed to emulate. While there are plenty of good games in the series, there are now more mediocre titles than good ones, such is the way with yearly releases. Regardless, no matter the reception or quality of the latter releases, we can always go back in time to remind ourselves of what made the original so darn good in the first place. Tight shooting, careful pacing, excellent environmental design, and an understated but compelling story and atmosphere are what lend modern warfare its identity, and are all reasons I keep coming back to it 16 years later. Thank you all so much for watching, and as previously mentioned, if you liked the video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. Special shout out to the greatest patrons in the world, your patience means the world to me. And thank you all for watching once again, and please, have a great day. Oh, no.